The Secret of the Conde Hermanos, Chapter 6. The Chacon is the music by which the angels ascend to heaven, like hawks who soar in circles ever higher in invisible columns of air. That's a beautiful analogy, Carlos, Gwen noted as she sat with Dr. Cordero on his front veranda, which looked out over the bluffs of Pacific Palisades. Warm thermal updrafts occurred there with great frequency and attracted hawks, as well as hang gliders and remote control model planes. Oh, I can't take credit for it. No, that belongs to Blanquita. Gwen knew by this time that Blanquita was Dr. Cordero's deceased wife, or his little white lamb, as he referred to her. They had met in San Francisco, where Dr. Cordero's parents had settled after fleeing the Spanish Civil War. His father, an accomplished violinist, found a teaching position at the San Francisco Conservatory, and his mother, a concert pianist, taught piano privately. They regularly entertained other Spanish exiles when they had occasion to be in San Francisco, most notably Segovia. Sabicas, Carmen Armaya, and Pablo Casals. As a child, he had had the good fortune of drifting off to sleep under the dining room table with the voices of these artistic giants swirling and surging in his head. As he got older and returned for the summer from his studies at UC Davis, he became a regular patron at Chateau Madrid whenever Sabicas and Carmen Armaya were in town and performing there. It was at Chateau Madrid that he met Blanquita, a young and promising flamenco dancer from Barcelona. Blanquita was always a mystery to me, Dr. Cordero confided, so pale and docile as her name suggests, and yet a stern and formidable dancer. Seco, muy seco, he repeated and closed his eyes as if savoring the thought. Gwen knew that Blanquita and Dr. Cordero had married quickly upon his graduation, and they had moved to Los Angeles, where Dr. Cordero had started his veterinary practice. They had continued his parents' tradition of entertaining Spanish exiles and played host to Segovia when he was in town, giving a master class at USC, or Sabicas when he played in the summertime at the Hollywood Bowl. Somewhere very deep in her soul, Blanquita loved box Chacon, Dr. Cordero continued. And it was at her insistence that I learned to play it. Segovia would try to coach me through some of the more difficult passages, but in the end, even he said it all came down to one thing, practice. How many times a day do you practice that difficult part, Carlitos? He would ask me. Oh, at least 25, maestro, I would respond. Not enough, Hoven. Do it at least 100 times a day if you hope to see any improvement. And as you well know, I am still chipping away at it till this day. Gwen also knew that Dr. Cordero and his wife had been happily married for 20 years. But one day, 15 years ago, Blanquita had suddenly died. Dr. Cordero had never mentioned how, and it was not in Gwen's nature to pry. But catching a s sight of a hawk gliding gracefully in the bluffs that afternoon and smelling the air filled with the intoxicating licorice scent of anise in bloom, she had found herself saying without even thinking, How, Carlos, how did she die? At that point, Bartholomew, Dr. Cordero's tabby cat, jumped into his lap. As the doctor stroked the cat's upturned chin, he turned to Gwen and said, Bartholomew always has the final say in matters concerning the little white lamb, and he seems to think it's all right if I tell you. 
Dr. Cordero then explained that Bartholomew had been Blanquita's cat, acquired one year before she died. He had simply wandered out of the Marquez Knolls one day and into their small neighborhood market where Blanquita had stopped to buy a quart of milk. How he had managed to avoid being eaten by coyotes in the early morning dawn was a mystery to all. Everyone's cats in the knolls are strictly indoor creatures by necessity. Blanquita took him home and named him Bartholomew after one of the few apostles who witnessed the ascension into heaven. However, she called him Mew for short. Well, dear Gwen, Dr. Cordero continued more seriously, you have to understand that Blanquita and I were in general agreement on all things under the sun, except one. I, having been born in this country, and having grown up hearing the stories of exiles from Spain who had escaped narrowly with their lives, had no desire to set foot on that country's soil. But the little white lamb was younger than I, and Franco's regime was all she had ever known. So once a year, she returned without me to see her family during the Lenten season. She would then return by Easter to celebrate with me. Like all good flamencos, she had a healthy sense of superstition that flowed liberally in her veins, and it was on her final trip to Spain, just before her departure, that she said something extraordinary to me. Extraordinary, of course, only in retrospect. She said, Cordero de Dios, I am always with you, even when I am away. And to prove it, I am leaving Bartholomew as my abogado. He will henceforth represent me in my absence. Well, her return flight that year stopped in San Francisco before continuing to its final destination, Los Angeles. However, en route to L.A. it encountered severe weather and went down over the Pacific, not far from Monterey Bay. Oh, Carlos, Gwen gasped. I am so sorry. I had no idea. Well, let me tell you the rest, dear Gwen, he said calmly. You see, it's important. After receiving the news of her death, I took leave of my senses. I could not bear the thought of the little white lamb plunging helplessly into the sea. For two weeks, I neither ate nor slept. I stayed inside with the curtains drawn. I managed somehow to care for Bartholomew as he was all I had left of her. During the third week, I sat on this veranda as we are doing now, with Bartholomew on my lap and it was then that I saw it. I gazed into the sky and I beheld a hawk soaring in circles in an invisible column of air. The hawk climbed and climbed and climbed until it was the merest of specks. Hawks can climb over a mile into the sky under the right conditions, you know. I fixed my gaze hard upon that tiny speck so as not to lose sight of it, when all of a sudden it started returning to the earth, but not just simply descending. No, it was plummeting at a great speed, as if in free fall down an elevator shaft. I became alarmed. I feared for the life of the hawk. But just as it was approaching the highest tops of the trees, it changed its position from vertical to horizontal and began to steadily soar, slowly in circles again, in the invisible column of air. I knew then that it was the little white lamb telling me she had not crashed into the sea, that her spirit had soared in the nick of time, and that she wanted me to stop torturing myself 
and rejoin the living. At this point, Bartholomew leapt off Dr. Cordero's lap and stood by the front door with his tail held high as if to suggest that it was lunchtime. Apparently, I've said enough for today, the good doctor mused. Come, Gwen, join us for sardine sandwiches. This had been in late June, and two weeks later, Gwen received a call from Dr. Cordero. He told her how he had found Bartholomew lying almost an entire day on a pile of unread mail that had been accumulating for some time on his dining room table. Having learned over the years that Bartholomew worked like the Lord in mysterious ways, he thought it would be prudent to examine the resting place more thoroughly. Indeed, just as I suspected, he informed Gwen, it was a communication from the little white lamb herself. You see, Mew had chosen to rest atop a schedule for the upcoming Carmel Bach Festival. And upon closer examination, I discovered that the Spanish classical guitarist Angel Romero is this season's guest artist. And not only that, he will be performing box Chacon. One rarely has the opportunity to hear the piece in its entirety, let alone on a classical guitar. Carlos, you have to go, Gwen said with a sense of urgency in her voice. Precisely, my dear, and <coughs> post-haste. The concert is in two days. Could you be so kind as to house it and look after Bartholomew while I'm away? He enjoys the company of kittens, so young Blaise will have a jolly good time and by all means bring the Conde Hermanos. She could hear the excitement mounting in Dr. Cordero's voice. Of course I can half sit, but where will you stay on such short notice, she asked, knowing the popularity of that charming hamlet by the sea, particularly during the festival. With my niece Paloma, who conveniently lives in Carmel, sang Dr. Cordero festively. Dear Gwen, I feel the helping hand of the little white lamb working in her unseen way. She thanks you in advance for all your trouble. There are not many with whom she would trust, her beloved Bartholomew. I'm honored. Gwen arrived early the next morning as Dr. Cordero was departing to begin his six-and-a-half-hour journey up Highway 101. Three days later, Gwen received a most unwelcome phone call. Hello, you do not know me, but this is Paloma Cordero, and I'm afraid I have some rather unfortunate news, the unfamiliar voice began. I understand that you're house-sitting for my uncle Carlos, and I'm sorry to inform you that he passed away last night. That can't be true, was all Gwen could say. I wish it wasn't, but sadly I was there. I accompanied him to a concert last night at All Saints Church in Carmel. It was a candlelight performance, too beautiful for words, really, given by a renowned Spanish guitarist, Angel Romero. He was performing a piece particularly close to my uncle's heart, the Chacon by Bach. It was actually much beloved by my Aunt Blanquita as well. When it was over, I thought it strange that my uncle did not applaud. I turned to look at him. His eyes were closed, and he was smiling beatifically. I imagined he was simply overcome by a profound joy brought on by the music. I waited out of respect for a few moments until I realized he wasn't breathing. Paramedics were called, but it was too late. He was already gone. I don't know what to say, Gwen whispered hoarsely. Don't say anything, Paloma recommended sympathetically. Here's my number. Call me later today. Gwen hung up and felt a wave of nausea pass over her entire being. Fresh air, fresh 
air was her only thought. She stumbled out the front door onto the veranda, taking in large gulps of air as if she were somehow drowning. As she sat heavily down on a porch rocker, she immediately felt the pressure of a weight simultaneously landing on her lap. Oh, Bartholomew, Bartholomew, she allowed herself to sob at last. What will we do? What will we do? The tabby cat stared at her with his large, penetrating green eyes, just as she glanced over the bluffs and beheld two hawks riding the thermal updrafts and the memory of Carlos quoting the beautiful analogy of the little white lamb came rushing back to her. The chacon is the music by which the angels ascend to heaven, like the hawks who soar in circles ever higher in invisible columns of air, he had told her. <coughs> Early that evening, she phoned Paloma to ask her what the funeral arrangements would be. She found out that Dr. Cordero had left implicit instructions with his niece. He made it known to me shortly after my aunt had died, Paloma explained, that he wished to be cremated and for his ashes to be scattered on the waters of Monterey Bay off Lover's Point so as to be laid as near as possible to his wife. Is there anything I can do? Gwen asked feebly, wishing for some small way to banish the small and useless feeling one inevitably feels in the face of the finality of death. There is actually, Paloma's, Paloma's tone seemed to suggest the possibility of some small yet purposeful role she could play. Uncle Carlos provided for Bartholomew in his will without designating an actual guardian. Would it be possible for you to assume the responsibility? It would be my great honor and privilege, Gwen found herself saying, as an enormous weight seemed to live from her heart. You realize, I'm sure, that Bartholomew is much more than a cat. For 15 years, he was my uncle's bridge between this world and the next. In that time, much information was exchanged, and it accounted for my uncle's uncanny intuition. Bartholomew will continue, no doubt, in this capacity, but now for you. Presumably, Gwen murmured softly as she watched the old tabby cat and white kitten gazing together out the window, patiently following the progress of the tenderly misshapen gibbous moon, making her wobbly yet deliberate ascension into the evening sky. Mm -hmm.